Welcome to the latest episode of the IA School of Thought series with me, Syed Kamal. I'm the Academic and Research Director at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Now, this series is based on the IA book, School of Thought, 101 Great Liberal Thinkers by Eamon Butler, which, as the title suggests, summarises the thoughts of leading classical liberal thinkers on a range of issues and discusses them within a modern context. All the episodes in this series and all our other online content can be found on the IA YouTube channel, IA London, or on Podbean, or on our website, ia.org.uk. Today's featured thinker is economist and Nobel laureate Ronald Coase, known the world over for his theory of the firm. And I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Dr. Chento Velianovsky, who's an e economist, IA fellow in law and economics, and the former research and editorial director at the IA. In effect, um, he's one of my predecessors. So Chento, welcome, uh, welcome back, and thank you for joining me today. It's a pleasure. So can I start off by asking, why did you pick uh, Ronald Coase? Uh, was there anything particular that inspired you about him? Uh, you know, did, did he have a profound impact on you specifically, or did you, did you admire the role he played in shaping our thinking? Yes, he had a profound impact. Uh, as an undergraduate and a graduate in Australia, uh, I came across his work. And because I was doing law and economics, I immediately saw that A, law did not have a theory or a framework in which uh, you could discuss the uh, certainly the impact of the law, but certainly the coherence of it. And what he gave uh, what, by analysing uh, various numbers of cases in a, a very important article he wrote, The Problem of Social Cost, he showed how economics uh, could be used to analyse the law, but also that the law had a, a more profound understanding of some of the economic issues uh, than uh, economists had. And uh, so my first article I ever published uh, in the economic record was in uh, 1977, um, which emerged, and I wasn't aware at the time, was one of the first debates outside the United States about the so-called Coase theorem and its validity. And my whole career has basically been uh, focused on the application of economics to law, and it's been uh, greatly influenced by Coase and his work and those who followed him. And, and was he unique in uh, addressing that particular issue about the economics of law, or were there many other uh, contemporaries around the, the same time? Well, what was unique about Coase is he wasn't that interested in, uh, <clears throat> uh, I, I suppose, the law itself. He was using that as a way of saying that economists should look at institutions. So he was, in some sense, harking back to the old-style political economy, where you looked at economics in its legal and political context. Um, but he, he was really trying to address what he saw as a flaw in the economist market failure approach. He was trying to get to uh, uh, to get economists to look at real world problems rather than benchmarking the real world against the, the competitive market model and market failure. And his basic uh, contribution to the core of economics was to say that given the assumptions of the perfectly competitive market model, which economists was, were using, uh, there couldn't be market failure. Market failure was the result of transaction costs. And you might want to look at why real world institutions developed, such as the firm um, and the various other organizations and why laws are framed in the, the way they are. And he attributed that to the existence of transaction costs. The laws, the firm were uh, institutional devices designed to economize on transaction costs. So that was his major contribution. Uh, and it was picked up by lawyers because they suddenly saw that what they could use economics to analyze legal cases, and they d developed that. And I believe that the problem of social costs is the most cited article in legal scholarship, um, uh, but not so that much in economics, oddly enough. Um, and we might come at what were the successes and failures of Coase's work. But uh, that was his major contribution. He wanted to change economists' uh, thinking about uh, market failing government regulation. So when we look back at his work now, you know, there are clearly two pieces of work that stand out, and you've mentioned them. One is the nature of a firm from 1937, where he showed about the, how the structure of firms uh, depended on transaction costs. And, and the 1960 publication, The Problem of yeah. Social Cost, where he outlined the theorem that there could be no market failure in perfectly competitive markets. Was he someone who struggled to have his ideas adopted or listened to at the time, only to be vindicated later? Or did he have an immediate impact with both those works? Uh, no, he didn't have an immediate impact. And uh, I think later in his life, he, he expressed uh, regret that he hadn't had enough impact on 
economist. He had a major impact on law because the law and economics movement or the economic analysis of law uh, flourished, particularly in North America. Uh, and now I, it is probably no uh, law school in the United States that doesn't have a, a professor of economics on the law faculty. Um, so I think he was disappointed in, in the, the uh, impact that he made because as far as economists were concerned, with regard to the problem of social costs, which gave rise to the Coase theorem, it was viewed as very much a sort of market manifesto. And, you know, we're all in the best of all possible worlds because any uh, apparent failure was uh, the result of uh, transaction costs. And so he wasn't really picked up by economists that much as by uh, lawyer, lawyers and economists working in law schools. And uh, there, there was a huge controversy over the problem of social costs as it developed. And I think uh, he stayed out of the controversy, but he was he eventually discussed it um, um, and tried to set the, the record straight. But it just took off on the various tangents of focus on the Coase theorem rather than his more sort of practical advice is that you have to look at real world institutions and you have to compare uh, what, what's now known as a comparative institutional approach. You have to compare uh, one reality with another rather than benchmarking things against competitive market model, which he described as sort of blackboard economics. Um, it wasn't, uh, oddly enough, that interested in some areas that you would have thought he would have had a major impact. When he was at Chicago, he was a professor of law and economics at Chicago in the law school. He taught antitrust law, but he advised economists to stay away from it, oddly enough, even though Chicago had a major impact on the development of antitrust, because he said the economists would become too influenced by being what he called economic statesmen, wanting to say something about, to lawyers about what you know is the optimal policy or what policies they should adopt. So he was, a, in that sense, he was quite a purist. He said, and you mentioned the two articles, the theory of the firm and the social cost. These are two articles, 30 years apart, um, uh, which basically focus on the same concept of transaction costs. And he got a Nobel Prize for that. So there's a lesson for young budding economists is, you know, write less, think more, and wait three or four, three to six decades to get a Nobel Prize. But oddly enough, there's a, the problem of social costs was uh, preceded by an analysis of the Federal Communication Commission. And if there's one single success you could point to Ronald Coase is that he, in that article, he was talking about the allocation of radio spectrum. And he said, the radio spectrum traditionally had been allocated by administrative criteria and by government, and a lot of it was uh, warehoused by the military and security forces. And he said, well, he was commissioned by the RAND Corporation with a couple of other economists to look in how to get a more efficient allocation of radio spectrum, because it was wastefully allocated. And he suggested uh, creating a, a market or an auction system to sell a spectrum. And uh, uh, he was heavily criticized. In fact, the RAND tried to withdraw their support for the report. Uh, and they, they described it as, as he was advocating corruption to sell a spectrum. It was a corrupt idea. Um, but, you know, two decades ago, it was picked up by governments. It's a major success policy. And he was really one of the few uh, who initially suggested a market allocation approach to spectrum, which has now been adopted. So his practical success is is been in a spectrum allocation policy. Now you mentioned two decades ago. Interesting enough, two decades ago is when I began my academic career post uh, just after my PhD, and the area I taught in was the area of international business. And every undergraduate lecture I taught has uh, a little, a few slides about the theory of the firm and co. So clearly, by then he had become hugely influential uh, across the political spectrum in the theory of the firm and, and in academia. So, so he clearly was influential there. But how influential do you think he has been in shaping the sort of the whole classical liberal narrative um, and that, that contribution to economics and politics as well? Yeah. Well, one thing I'll append to what you've just said, he's been quite successful in business schools because, you know, they're looking at very detailed analysis of business strategy. So a lot of the economists working in the area who have adopted a, a Coase approach uh, come from the business school or law schools, but not from mainstream economics. Uh, you pick up an economics textbook and you'll see some reference to the Coase theorem and, 
and probably some suggestion that you know that's a theoretical proposition. Uh, how influential has he been? As I said, he had his. Re he was disappointed that he hadn't had an impact on mainstream economics uh, because he, he's also uh, quite well known for other uh, areas that he got envisioned, which was the marginal cost controversy, in particular, and then the monopoly and durable goods. And, and he's actually associated with two theorems. Um, the coast conjecture in industrial economics, um, but I, I think if I uh, if I look say at the area of industrial economics or antitrust, it doesn't seem to have had that much impact uh, overall. Uh, he's had an impact in in a more indirect way of uh, people recognizing government failure, the need to take into account the costs of government compared to the costs of the market. But I think you you know. As a, the research director of the IA, you will appreciate that the market failure process is very persuasive, uh, pervasive, uh, and and used routinely to say, well, look, you know, the market fails, we've got to have some intervention, and and not really analysing what the intervention is. I mean, I'm just doing some work on algorithms and uh, digital antitrust, and they all talking about the problems of Google and Facebook and and various other. Uh, digital platforms, and it's all compared, you know, the failure in the digital sector is compared with ideal regulation that's going to come in and, and stop it. So, you know, bad behavior by digital platforms is compared to smart regulation. Uh, uh, so it's, it's this comparative institutions approach, I think, that was then fostered by Demsets and Oliver Williamson that uh, it's probably been the major intellectual impact uh, uh, and people like Ostrom and, and other institutional economists have, have picked that up. And, and, you know, to be totally uh, objective about it, that, that sort of swathe of institutional economists, Ostrom, Williamson, um, uh, Coase, of course, and, 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 and all, uh, Douglas North, all those institutional economists did get Nobel Prize in the end because they had a fundamental insight that you have to look at property rights institutions to understand the way the economy is developing and what are the uh, you know, pros and cons of various alternatives. So it's had an, uh, an indirect Im impact. But I think if you mention Ronald Coase to people now, uh, they'd know the Coase theorem if they were doing an undergraduate degree. But I don't think they'd say, well, this is the core of our arsenal to look at economic problems, rightly or wrongly. Um, that, that's my feeling because law and economics petered out in the UK. It's still a, it's got quite popular on continental uh, Europe. But again, it's a different style of law and economics that's developed, which is more mathematical, more empirical. He was quite anti, you know, treating uh, humans as rational human beings. Um, he was concerned with choice, with studying institutions and other to understand their economic impact rather than trying to apply economics to analyze institutions. Um, and so he, he he sort of started to separate himself, for example, from the Chicago economic and analysis of law. Oh, and I think they were they were quite a loggerheads at, at some periods in their professional careers. So I mean, Eamon Butler says in the book, uh, in his little bit about Ronald Coase, he says that he was influential in addressing the solution to market failure, not necessarily being government intervention or regulation, but to clarify property rights in order to cut transaction costs and to enable market solutions to emerge. And he talks about how this hugely influenced debates on environmental issues um, and clearly informed the work of Eleanor Ostrom on managing common pool resources. Um, so we know about he clearly has an influence in many ways, not only in his own field and theory of the firm or how he's better known, but with classical liberals and common pool resources. Um, but do we know much about who influenced him and his ideas? Yes, I mean, uh, in uh, in the the book that we, the IEA, published uh, 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 some years ago, which was a sort of commemorative volume of Ronald Coase's life, it was just published after he died, and he lived for a long, long time. He was 103 when he uh, uh, left us. Um, he, he, as you may, uh, mentioned. Uh, he was at the LSE. He was doing uh, uh, 
industrial relations type course. And he says himself that had he not uh, met Arnold Plant, who was at the LSC, um, who changed his view about markets, because I think uh, Coast originally was a, a sort of uh, on the left side of uh, thinking at the time. And uh, he got a, scholar, uh, a sort of grant or a scholarship to go study firms in the United States. And that's where he developed this notion of transaction costs. Um, and so he, de he developed the notion in, in basically as an undergraduate uh, and uh, then worked it up into an article uh, some years later. Uh, and so he uh, uh, started to change track from, as he says himself, he would have become a lawyer, an industrial labor lawyer, as we call them today. Uh, but he was influenced by the thinking of Arnold Plant, the LSC, and a lot of his economics was uh, really uh, the LSC type of concept of costs, which has subjective opportunity costs. Um, so when you see economic models in books, they say C is the cost. And normally when they try to uh, test it, they will look at the accounting costs or some uh, adjustment to accounting costs. But what the, he had and what, what drove the coast in was the concept of opportunity cost. The cost of something is what you give up in order to, to get it. And that links the concept of cost to resource allocation because you and the, how markets work they're constantly comparing what is the best uh, place to uh, allocate uh, resources and that requires an opportunity cost notion of cost um he then uh, uh, after the war he became disillusioned with the uh, what was happening in the united kingdom um on the path of socialism so he left and took up uh, uh um the, Professor, lectureships or professorships at American universities. And uh, I think he was at Buffalo originally, then went to Virginia, and then was uh, uh, approached by the University of Chicago really to set up uh, the Journal of Law and Economics, which was also one of his great contributions because that prov provided an outlet for law and economics research. And he did more than just be the editor. He basically encouraged research, commented extensively on the articles uh, and uh, mentored people, as we say today. Uh, uh, and that, that was another success story of Ronald Coase and, of course, the law and economics movement. Um, so I don't think he... He basically made his life in the United States uh, and the environment there more conducive. But he was a, an outsider, uh, a fully paid-up member of the Awkward Squad, because he... I think one of the lessons one learns from Coase is don't believe other economists. <laughs> you know, if you, you think you're on the right track, stick with it, uh, uh, even though you're going to get uh, a lot of flack from like-minded fellow travelers <laughs> in, the, in the process. So he was uh, he was quite uh, consistent. And I, I think intellectually, he was probably a hard man to deal with <laughs> in the sense that uh, he had his views and he, he fostered them and good on him. Uh, it was a success story, um, but, uh, you know, it had some ups and downs. <laughs> well, you, you talk about where, you know, if, you know, if you have your particular views, you know, be aware of or don't necessarily don't listen to those who don't necessarily disagree with you. But what, what, why don't I look at that about this area of, of, of disagreement? You know, if you think about the sort of people who are, you know, are fans of the IA and the work we do, you know, classical liberals across the spectrum. You know, we, we all know that classical liberals don't have one view. Yeah. You can put two, two, in a, two in a room and get three different views. Um, where do you think classical liberals today might disagree with some of his conclusions? Um, it's a good question. I, I don't know that the, there would be a lot of the agreement. I don't think he would see himself necessarily in that sort of... Uh, Camp because he was he, he was probably what you call an economist economist he was interested in what the real world told us about economics and that we should focus on uh, studying the real world to to better understand the economy and economic behaviour so I think his scope was narrow I don't recall an uh, an article by him that uh, overarched into his policy or philosophy uh, and. I can give you quotes from him uh, warning people to stay away from, you know, practical uh, 
legal analysis, such as antitrust and becoming experts in antitrust cases, because it would color the way they saw things. So, but but he was a, you know, if, if, I hate to use the term, but let's let's say classical liberal in the sense that he believed in markets, he believed in the efficiency of markets, he was skeptical about government, uh, and he felt that a lot of economists were analyzing situations from this theoretical point of view, uh, when in fact, uh, when you looked at the facts more clo closely, you could identify uh, that there were uh, reasons, transaction cost reasons, why uh, uh, it was done in this particular way. For example, I think a number of economists used the Fisher body case of showing the uh, monopolization of the car body uh, industry and saying uh, it was uh, due to significant transaction costs and opportunism and uh, market power that this Fisher body, the main car bodies for a big manufacturer, was uh, taken over. But he said, when you look at the facts, this wasn't the case. And, you know, the, we can see a number of examples, such as in the market failure literature, the lighthouse, the fable, the, the fable of the bees and all that, that uh, people are saying, well, that's market failure. And then people like Chung and Peacock look more carefully and show that, you know, lighthouses were privately provided, you know, apiarists and orchardists came to agreements in some uh, counties in the United States because they realized they were providing a reciprocal externalities to each other. And so they had commercial relationships to take account of that. Um, and so um, in that sense, he, he was cautious about leaping immediately to the government regulation box to solve the problem. He said a lot of these problems are not problems. They've been solved by the marketplace and we've got to study them in, in much more detail. Um, well, his ideas on transaction costs are still are still very much in vogue today. In fact, we have a forthcoming book at the IAA from Michael Munger on the sharing economy, and Michael Munger writes in, writes in that book that he said he shows how it's uh, how technology lowers transaction costs, which allows many of the companies like Uber and Airbnb uh, to, uh, to to emerge. Do you think yeah. that? Do you think um, uh, Coase would have felt that his work had been vindicated by the uh, sharing economy? Well. The transaction cost approach uh, started to get very developed by Oliver Williamson. And I think uh, toward the, towards the end of his career, I think he was a member, founding member of the the new institutionalist or new institutional uh, movement, of which Oliver Williamson was a major proponent who also got a Nobel Prize. And yes, uh, he would see that. He would say, you know, uh, Tech, technology or devices that lower transaction costs lead to the development of new services and uh, doing things better. And of course, Munger did contribute to this book too. So this is the progenitor of his ideas about what <laughs> um, uh, well he's, he's developing into a full-scale um, uh, paperback now. Well, Chento, I'm speaking to you in the uh, middle of a pandemic, maybe not the middle, but somewhere in the middle, you know, we're, we're entering, I think, week 16 next week. Um, were there are there lessons from uh, Coase's work for how governments would should deal with the pandemic? Or are, are there any lessons, or am I just looking for tenuous links where there are, where there are none? Yes, it's a good question. I don't think... Uh... He was thinking about pandemics when he was writing his various of course not, yes. uh, approaches, but uh, I think he, he would be looking, at, first of all, at cooperative relationships and uh, voluntary relationships to deal with uh, pandemics. Uh, and like most economists, he would be saying, well, are, are these uh, government interventions targeted at the real real problem? problem? And, you know, I don't think he would ha have... Uh, any ready-made answers to that, and I, I, I would be very surprised if he even probably commented, would be willing to have commented on it, because it was outside the province of what he was typically uh, focused on, which was what we now call institutional law or industrial economics, it was his forte. Um, but it would be 
Well, I've read most of his work, and I, I don't recall anything about pandemics. Of course, well, I don't think you're it. <laughs> but I suppose everything's about pandemics at the moment, or or digital. Yeah. So, and, and and do we know much about him as a person? I mean, was he a family man? You know, um, do, do we? Uh, you know, did uh, you know? Did he share his work with his family, or was he? Or was it very private? You know. I don't really know. I didn't know him at a personal level. Um, some of our colleagues knew him much better, like Stephen Littlechild, but I don't I don't know. I mean, uh, he lived to a very old age. Um, yeah, I don't think I can answer what okay. he was like as a, as a person. I mean, the, the one of the big anecdotes that is mentioned in, in Forever Contemporary, the book we did on coasts, uh, and, and has done the rounds many times, is how he persuaded the whole Department of Economics at Chicago that he was right, because initially, in social costs, they said, you're wrong, and that's just incorrect. So Aaron Director invited them over for an uh, afternoon drink, basically, um, and it, the whole Economics Department was there, and he had, I think, probably only one economist agreed with him to start off, and by the end of the night, he had the whole faculty, 20-odd economists, agreeing that he was correct. And he would say that it was just common sense and quite simple economics that he was uh, putting forward. It was just common sense to him that that, that was right. Uh, that, uh, you know, whether you make a train liable for the damages it does or not liable, the zero transaction costs, the farmers and the, the train company will negotiate to get the optimal amount of uh, sparks and damage to crops. Um, that, that was one of the examples he's used, the fire emitting uh, train. Um, and it all, all rested on really the LSE concept of opportunity and subjective cost and one action is measured, the cost of one action is measured in terms of what you give up uh, to undertake that action. So, yeah, pandemics, I don't know. Okay, well, Chanto, we've had a fascinating conversation about uh, Ronald, Ronald Coase. In summing up, you know, uh, you clearly are an admirer. You've been influenced by him. Um, if someone said to me, come on, Chanto, tell me about Ronald Coase in a few sentences. What, you know, why should I be so interested in this work? What would you say in a couple of sentences? Well, I'd say, first of all, that he fundamentally changed a, a, a whole area of scholarship or created not only one area of scholarship, but several areas of scholarship, law and economics, economic analysis of law, which is more of a law. And he, he greatly influenced uh, legal scholarship. There's no doubt about that. Um, and secondly, he, he cautions uh, economists not to immediately jump to the government regulation box when there is a perceived market failure. That the competitive market model is useful as a heuristic device, but is not useful as a way of thinking about the economy, because there's no perfectly competitive market, there's no perfect regulation, and there's a choice between the two, and where the boundary lies can only be understood by a careful analysis. Um, and so I think there are his two messages. You've got to compare uh, realistic alternatives, um, and you've got to do your homework in terms of understanding fully what the institutions are actually doing. Uh, and I suppose, in a nutshell, he says, uh, you know, what happens is reality will always make good theory. Um, uh, if you want to look at it that way. But I think well, that's, that, that's his contribution. Well, that's a lovely note to end on. Uh, Dr. Cento Velinovsky, thank you very much for joining us for School of Thought, 101 uh, Liberal Thinkers. And to your viewers, uh, to you viewers and listeners, thank you very much for joining us. If you would like more information on our publications, our webinars and our other online content, please check out our YouTube channel, IA London, and listen to our podcasts on Podbean. And to help us keep providing free content during these tough times, please do consider making a contribution, no matter how modest, by donating online at ia.org.uk. Thank you for watching or listening today, and we hope that you'll be able to join us again soon. Thank you. Thank you.